Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Get yourselves in the spots. So the way I'd like to start today uh, is I want you to rub your hands together. It's going to feel some energy. You can feel it warming up. Do it as fast and as hard as you can. And then when you stop doing it, you can feel the energy field in between your hands. So pull them apart slightly. And you can feel that there's still like this energy connection, energetic connection in between your hands. We all have this energy field that goes with us everywhere we go. And it affects the people around us, and we get affected by other people's energy fields. So by doing this, this is one way that we can feel our own energy and how we carry that through. It's also a good way to get the blood flowing, get the energy up. My hands are cold this morning. So energy we're going to be talking a lot about energy today as we uh, as we move through today's class first i'd like to tell you a little bit about this this art that's up on the screen right now it's done by a middle school student named roy park from las vegas nevada and he says this about this beautiful piece of art that he created he said when i first decided to draw my artwork I thought of drawing a little polar bear on a block of melting ice, signifying how global warming is affecting our oceans. Then I learned how the thickness and extent of the Arctic ice has been declining rapidly over the last decades, and how glaciers are also retreating almost everywhere around the world, from the Alps, the Himalayas, the Andes, the Rockies, Alaska, and Africa. And then I realized I should be drawing a bear that has already sunk, not one that is floating on melting ice. This gave me a clearer picture of how our glaciers and ocean animals are sinking away too fast. And it inspired me to draw this piece that I call Sinking Beauty. Sinking Beauty is an illustration of a polar bear sinking from the destruction that humans have caused displaying the cold, hard facts from the torture of our ocean on its fur. In the end, I hope the viewer understands this ghastly change to our Earth from my art and stands with me against this outrage. So the other day, one of you mentioned that it was really hard to watch the video with the birds and the plastic. And it's a lot of feelings. A lot of feelings are coming up. So when we think about this, drawn by a middle school student, there's lots of feelings going on. So what is it that sometimes blocks us from feeling? Think about yourself. What, why might you like push feelings away or push feelings down or not let yourself have feelings? Why is that? You can talk to your neighbor about it for a minute. What blocks me from feeling?
what do you say? What blocks you from feeling? For me, it's time. When I feel rushed during the day, when I feel like there's too much on my plate, and then my kids come to me and say, you know, this thing happened at school, and I go, oh, okay, that's too bad, that's really sad. Like, and then I find that I put up this wall, that I'm blocked from having my full feelings. So what do you find blocks you? Um, I think for me, I, it's mostly just like commitments. If I have commitments in the way, then it's kind of hard to really feel out my feelings because that does take time and it takes away from my focus from the commitments that I have. So it's just kind of balancing those two and finding time to be able to actually feel what I'm feeling. Yeah, having time to feel what I'm feeling. Yep, I hear that. For me, I also feel like the term like ignorance is bliss really goes with this as well because it's like if these feelings are really uncomfortable if these feelings are making me feel bad then like I'd rather just not feel them I'd rather not think about it so I think it's important to really try not to do that and embrace the discomfort because you'll grow a lot from that thank you yeah I agree thank you anything else thanks Ish. uh I say um doubt to yourself, self-doubt, or like what Justin yeah. said, uh, overwhelming thoughts in your head. Um, probably like thinking about like what would that person say, like how would they feel, especially with like, different people, and, like how they take things, and like some people are sensitive, some people are not. So you yeah. just try to like be aware of like what you say, uh, from true, and that keeps you from like truly like saying how you feel. Yeah. Um. Other people's reactions. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. I get that too, thank you. Yeah, lots of that. That feeling of, Jennifer, you're being too dramatic. Oh, but that's what I'm feeling. But if that's how you're gonna feel about my feelings. Yes, what else? I think because you try to like stop yourself from feeling like her or like feeling a certain feeling that's uncomfortable. So instead of like, because when you bring it up, it can make you feel worse. So you try not to do that. Could, so you, that could, could you use eye language? I think that you are on the right track. Say okay. it. Um, what blocks me from feeling is because I'm scared that I'm going to get hurt. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, there's one over here. Thanks, Lauren. Hello. Okay. Hi. Um, so I used to block my feelings a lot because I thought it made people uncomfortable. But I realized you're going to feel these feelings anyway at some point, whether that comes out as anger or sadness. And you're going to feel those feelings, and that's going to probably come out in other people. So I kind of learned it's okay to feel those feelings when you do feel them. Yeah, in Sorry, the that's, moment. Yeah, that's how it feels. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Rather than holding it in and letting it explode out sometime when you might not be ready for it, um, but letting it out as it comes up. So that's all really good, and I think it's all really accurate. And I think that knowing that we're in the same boat, a lot of us are carrying around these feelings that might be just stuck um, for some reason. Um, and so acknowledging that we're human, um, so this is where we ended the other day with the definition of love. Um, and so that is a feeling, right? Allowing ourselves to feel requires some vulnerability and it takes energy. Allowing ourselves to be real and not to hide. And so I'd like you to take in this short video that I thought was pretty interesting about why we have feelings. Um, to acknowledge that there's a reason for this. So, yeah. Um, all right, so on to emotions. What is an emotion? The short answer, emotions are physical signals that are delivered through the body to let us know that we need or want something. To break it down a little, emotions have three parts. The first is the physical feeling itself. 
Maybe you've heard the idea that emotions are energy in motion. Well, it's true. First, something happens in our environment and then we interpret it. We might interpret it consciously or even more often, there's at least aspects that are interpreting it subconsciously without your awareness. And however you interpret the emotion is gonna signal a physical reaction in the body. This physical response is how we know we're experiencing an emotion. If the body didn't feel an emotion, we wouldn't know the emotion is there. This is important in meditation because your body is your emotional signaling device. When you wanna know how you feel, that's where to look. The second aspect of emotion is why we feel it, which is to motivate us. Emotions are an evolutionary aspect of the human self that tells us when we need to change something. And these changes can happen in one of two directions. Positive emotions motivate us to change things in a positive direction, to keep doing more of whatever makes us feel good. Negative emotions motivate us in a negative direction. They feel awful, so we naturally want to avoid them or limit the degree to which we feel them. So it signals if something's not working for us and if we need to change something, do something differently. And then the last aspect of emotion is how we interpret the emotion itself. And this is super important because how we understand and think about our emotions is gonna dictate how we behave and listen to our emotions. So often we think of emotions as these like mysterious, scary, unpredictable forces that come at us. But what if we did interpret them more as just signaling devices? That might not only make emotions feel less scary, but it might give you a more effective way to deal with them. Because when you look at your emotions as a signaling device, you might start to listen to what they're trying to tell you. It's like emotions are just the messenger and don't shoot the messenger. It's not gonna solve your problem. If anything, it's just gonna have more and more messages keep coming at you. If you actually listen to the message that's being directed, you might actually be able to do something better for yourself. Well, I hope this video helped to explain the purpose of emotion. If you... So it's something that can motivate us. So it can motivate us to make change in one way or the other. And I think that that's really important. So thinking about the albatross and the plastic video, you feel emotions and maybe that's triggering you to make some kind of change, make some kind of um, difference in your, the way that things are around the world as well as then for yourself. So I think that that's going to be interesting and really important to keep in mind as we go through um, as we go through these other challenges that we're facing in the world. So today is about climate. The scientific evidence for warming of the climate system is unequiv unequivocal, which means it's definite, which means it's certainly happening. The world is on fire from the Amazon to California, from Australia to the Siberian Arctic. The hour is late and the moments of consequences so long delayed is now upon us. It's happening. So do we watch the world burn or we cho do we choose to do what's necessary to achieve a different future? So we've known about the possibility of climate change since the 1930s. And then we've been absolutely certain that it's happening since the 1960s, and yet not much has been done to counter that. So we're at a point now where absent heroic efforts, the world is dangerously locked in this climate change. So there are reports coming out very regularly about what's happening uh, to climate and with climate, and a lot of people are working on this. There is the, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which has a whole, like hundreds of scientists who are doing thousands of research projects on what's happening with climate. So the goal is that we can't let the climate warm any more than 1.5 degrees Celsius over where normal should be. And we're getting really close to that 1.5 
degrees. So there are uh, impacts of this, right? On ecosystems and human communities, there are all kinds of things that are happening related to this. Um, and yet, this year, more than ever before, people everywhere have been connecting the dots between the climate change and the terrible damage that's being done by extreme weather. So that's what comes to the forefront, is what's happening with our weather that is connected to this climate change. And so this has brought a new urgency, and with this urgency comes opportunity. People are finally growing more receptive to the idea that we have to do something because it's affecting more and more people. And therefore, policymakers are seeing that the people are wanting to make some changes. So it's all, it's this like, have to go up the ladder in order to make change. But it's affecting our weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. The, the scientists are observing changes in the climate, the atmosphere, the oceans, the ice flows on land. And some of them are already irreversible. So we're already experiencing some of these effects. Um, and yet there's still time that we have to make change. But we're going to be dealing with these, um, with these effects for a long time. What we need are strong and sustained reductions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So they must be sustained, right? We just learned on Monday about the cod, that as soon as the cod numbers started to go up, then people took more again, and then the cod numbers dropped precipitously low. So these motion, you know, the things that we're gonna set in motion, we're gonna have to keep them in motion for the temperatures to stabilize. So the global temperatures, oh, excuse me, the Paris Agreement is the legally binding international treaty on climate change. Um, it was celebrated, it was signed actually in, by 196 countries, and then it was celebrated on Earth Day of 2016. So the idea is to limit that temperature change, 1.5 degrees Celsius, compared to our like pre-industrial levels, that the, the industrial era of the 1700s is what really started us on this, on this path. And then it's just gotten faster and faster. So this is the first time that there is a binding agreement between countries that they will work together to combat the climate change and whatever we need to do to adapt to the effects. So countries are supporting each other. Not every country can afford to make the change that's necessary. And so they're going to be you know, working together, which is pretty darn cool, financially and technically, and building the support for each other. We, the United States, are behind schedule in this. For a while, we had uh, leadership that didn't e believe that climate change existed, let alone that we needed to do anything about it. So the United States actually withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement under President Trump, and then as soon as, within a few hours of becoming president, um, Biden has re-signed us back into this. So now we are trying to catch up for some lost time. I mean lost time being since, whatever, the 1960s, but then even through this decade, we are needing to, to catch up. The way that this goes, the global temperature looks like this. And so the climate, the overarching patterns of weather, have changed over you know, they've been changing, we have records back to 650,000 years ago um, because of they can take ice cores and get that information. Um, and most of these, the historic, there have been other times when the climate changed dramatically, um, but not 
the way it is right now. We are on a dramatic change, and it's because of this. It's because the solar radiation comes down to, the, to Earth, and then it goes up, it bounces off the Earth and goes back up, um, and where energy is meant to escape. But with the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it's keeping those, it's bouncing the warm air, the energy is re being reflected back to Earth. So it's the gases, the heat trapping net nature of carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide and water vapor, and that's what's keeping the heat in, whereas it used to be able to move farther out. So what's why the greenhouse gases? The fu fossil fuel gases trapping heat in the atmosphere. The number one, number one is transportation. This is our number one cause in the United States is transportation, cars and buses, planes are pretty polluting. So transportation and then power plants, and then there is methane that's seeping directly out of oil and gas wells and leaks from pipelines. So the infrastructure that transports the gasoline to where we need it to get to so that we can put it into our cars. So there's some leaking out at every step of the way. So number one, it, the polluter, number one polluter in the United States or in the world is China and then the United States is second. So there's a lot of change that needs to happen. Those greenhouse gases, for centuries, the atmospheric carbon dioxide had never been above that line in the middle. Um, you can see it's going back 400,000 years, again, based on the ice cores, they can see this. And now our current level of atmospheric carbon dioxide is way above. Evidence can also be found in tree rings and in ocean sediments, in coral reefs, and in layers of sedimentary rock. So there are ways that, that we can detect and see what kind of change is happening. Here's a, a quick temperature graph. If you could pull this one up for me, Elizabeth. So watch the change in color as it runs through these temperatures. Starting in 1880, you can see that this is the scale up here above where we're not trying to get above one and a half degrees Celsius. So to 2014 is the latest that this goes. It's pretty dramatic change there. You can see until like 1960s, and then it becomes really Dramatic. Okay, thank you. So, our global economy runs on fossil fuels. So, how are we going to shift that? You know? There are some people, there are still, still some influential people that deny that climate change is human caused, so that's one thing. But then more so, there are people that are climate inactivists. So instead of activists making change and you know, actively changing things, there are people that are blocking that change, inactivists. And there are a couple of categories of those folks. There are the ones that are waiting to see the real reports, you know, just doubting the things that they're seeing and hearing. Um, and then they'll 
choose to make change when, when it's really evident to them that change needs to be made. And then there are those that acknowledge that climate change is happening, but they don't want to make change for some reason. And that could be because their world runs, the money that they get, the sustaining of their country, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, places where gasoline is like the major um, export that supports their entire economy. So it's easier for those people to say, no, actually, let's just wait on this and let's just you know, we'll, we'll try to deceive or create some disinformation. They might downplay the effects because their whole economy, even more than ours, might be run on fossil fuels. The fossil fuels, this is the primary energy world consumption. Uh, so you can see that coal is still, that's a significant challenge. Uh, and then we have this red is the natural gas, and then the green is oil. So then in the middle, we have the nuclear energy and the hydroelectricity run on, on water, and then the renewable energy here. Um, so this is from 2015. You can see the very dramatic ways that, uh, that it might be hard for people who are dependent on coal to change their dependence, change that oil dependence. So our current administration has made some strides towards change. Um, the efforts are good, but they aren't great. Uh, I just put, my mom sent me an article on Saturday uh, by Greta Thunberg the Swedish climate activist. Uh, she just published a, a piece on Saturday and I linked it in, our, in the week eight module for you to check out where Greta is saying, yeah, we're doing stuff, but we aren't doing enough stuff. So here in the United States, they've set that zero carbon emissions from power, usually using more wind and solar power um, and possibly a nuclear, but that's not an optimal choice. Um, power plants will look significantly different. Cars will not have combustion engines. This is all by 2035. Um, so what is that, 13 years from now? Those cars that don't have combustion engines, they won't be all Priuses, Teslas but they'll be made by GM and Ford and the, uh, the big auto manufacturers are already on board for this change. So the goal is that we'll be able to pull into a charging station, just like we do into the gas station, and that recharging the battery will, in your car will take just as long as currently it takes to fill with gasoline. It's really interesting to hear my kids speculate about what kind of cars they're going to own. They have all kinds of ideas, you know, that they're talking about Lamborghinis. And I'm trying to talk them down a little bit. But it's also interesting to think, I don't know what cars are going to look like 10 years from now. I don't know. It's so interesting to just have not any clue what's coming, and yet knowing that it won't be, it can't be what we have right now. So by 2050, they're saying that the United States will be at a level of zero carbon emissions. The United States now has a climate envoy, John Kerry. He's serving on the White House Security Council, which means that climate is now part of every White House discussion. So we are making strides. We are making change. We just got to keep it going and move it a little bit faster. So connecting to where we were on Monday, the warming oceans. The oceans are expected to continue getting warmer because they have already sucked in. The oceans have absorbed so much of the carbon dioxide that we have put into the atmosphere. The oceans are going to continue to get warmer for many years, even if we were to stop carbon emissions right now. So how does that affect this? Would you pull up the wave video for me, please? Yeah. 
Yep, thank you. But lately, it's I who feel wild, choked by your trash, overheated by your pollution. It makes me sick, it makes me lash out. Don't you know I can decimate you? What do you think I can do to your currents, your coastlines, your climate? My requirements are simple. Stop stripping the forests that keep my water clean. Stop filling the atmosphere with dead carbon. And keep your plastic to yourself. Work with me now. Before it's too late. I'll keep coming. I am the wave. So these videos put out, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, these videos put out by Conservation International, there's a whole series of them. I know this is the second one that I've shown. I encourage you to go and look at them. A lot of famous actors and actresses have, um, have put these up and been part of this effort, which I think is really beautiful, to bring our attention to these really important things. So the oceans are key, right? They're key to everything, the life on the whole planet. So the warmer oceans are what's affecting the weather, as we talked about the other day, causing more powerful tropical storms, impacting the sea life in lots of different ways. So because the ocean has done us this great service of absorbing about 150 billion tons of carbon dioxide. It's also changing the pH of the ocean, changing the, the acidity of the water, which then means it's, it's struggling to absorb more, right? It's a feedback loop, and this is a positive feedback loop, where the more it absorbs, actually the less it will be able to absorb the ice sheet. And ocean waters, the, because the ocean waters underneath are warmer, it is melting Antarctica from underneath those glaciers, those ice shelves. And so a new study, NASA is constantly studying the depth of these ice shields. Um, and they do that by satellite and aircraft readings. It's a very intense process. But what they know is that the ice shelves are getting much thinner, both in, the, in Antarctica as well as in the Arctic. So the summer minimum, this is from last summer, the reports haven't come out for this, this summer yet, um, but what you're seeing, that yellow line, is the median extent. That's the middle amount of ice there is usually uh, in between, between 1981 and 2010, it was much larger, and now that ice sh is getting, that ice cap is getting much smaller. So 
it's important to note this because as, the, as it continues to get smaller, more and more of the permafrost or the tundra that's underneath that darker part of the land is being, sh is like showing up out from under these big caps of ice. And so that darkness of that, um, of the tundra there is going to be absorbing even more and more warmth. You know that on a warm day, that if you wear black, you're feeling warmer and white helps to reflect. The white of this ice cap is, is doing that. It should be reflecting more of the sun's rays. So there are things that if we don't make change soon, then they're going to be very rapid in how they misinformation about what's happening, and that's what breeds the skepticism. So important as a region that we go, on, go beyond the conversation of if it's happening to how levels are rising. They're severely, right? This extreme tumult, millions of people have storms and droughts, the climate scientists and migration experts expect the number of climate refugees to rise, being moved from their homes because of these dramatic weather events, whether it be more water or whether it's less water. Patterns have changed. This is desertification. This is in Burkina Faso, and it's one of the countries most severely affected by desertification. It's the process where the biosphere, the earth, um, has disappeared. So the, the land here, you can't plant anymore because the topsoil is gone. The soil degradation, loss of nutri nutrients, decrease. And then as the soil solid, and there are also things like landslides and these extreme events that change their lives. The Arctic ice decrease, sea level rise, in Pennsylvania, it feels pretty safe, right? Feels pretty safe, but things are changing. Habitats are changing. The trees that grow here, like sugar maples, won't be able to grow here if the climate continues to... I used to say that America isn't under as much climate pressure as other people around the world, but considering hurricanes like last week's, wildfires, the unusual high and low temperatures, the statement isn't true any longer. We are in a dramatic climate time in the United States as well. I'd like you to take in this poem written by two people who are dramatically affected by weather events. We're gonna go to a video. Thinking about, yes, that one. Thinking about what will change as life goes on for them. Yep. Sister of ice and snow, I'm coming to you from the land of my ancestors, from atolls, sunken volcanoes, undersea descent of sleeping giants. Sister of ocean and sand, I welcome you to the land of my ancestors, to the land where they sacrificed their lives to make mine possible, to the land of survivors. I'm coming to you from the land my ancestors chose, Ailangainad, Marshall Islands, a country more sea than land. I welcome you to Gadaxlignunay, Greenland, the biggest island on earth. I bring these shells that I picked from the shores of Beginni Atoll and Runed Dome. In my hand I hold these rocks picked from the shores of Luke, the foundation of the land I call my home. Two sisters frozen in time on the island of Wuyai, one magically turned to stone, the other who chose that life to be rooted by her sister's side. To this day, the two sisters can be seen by the edge of the reef. 
a lesson, a story told countless times, a story about a babe at the bottom of the ocean. This is a story about the guardian of the sea. She sees the greed in our hearts, the, every whale, every stream, every iceberg are her children. When we disrespect them, she gives us what we deserve, a lesson in respect. Do we deserve the melting ice, the hungry polar bears coming to our islands, or the colossal icebergs hitting these waters with rage? From one island to another, I ask for solutions. From one island to another, I ask for your problems. Let me show you the time. Coming for us faster than we'd like to admit. Let me show you airports underwater, bulldozed reefs, blasted sands, and plans to build new atolls, forcing land from an ancient rising sea, forcing us to imagine turning ourselves to stone. Can you see a glacier's grown the weight of the world's heat? I wait for you, here on the land of my ancestors. Heart heavy with a continuous thirst for solutions. As I watch this land change while the world remains silent. Sister of ice and snow, I come to you now in grief. Mourning landscapes that are always forced to change. First through wars inflicted on us. Then through nuclear waste dumped in our waters. On our ice. And now this. Sister of ocean and sand, I offer you these rocks, the foundation of my home. May the same unshakable foundation connect us, make us stronger than these colonizing monsters that still to this day devour our lives. The very same beasts that now decide who should live, who should die. Sister of ice and snow, I offer you these shells and the story of the two sisters as testament, as declaration that despite what we are told, we will not leave. We will choose stone. We will choose to be rooted to this reef forever. Solutions. From these islands, we ask, we demand that the world see beyond ACs, SUVs, their pre-packaged convenience, their oil slick dreams. Beyond the belief that tomorrow will never happen, that this is merely an inconvenient truth. Let me bring my home to yours. Let's watch as Miami, New York, Shanghai, Amsterdam, London, Rio de Janeiro, and Osaka try to breathe underwater. You think you have decades before your home fall beneath tides? We have years, we have months before you sacrifice us again. Before you watch from your TV screens and computer screens to see if we will still be breathing while you do nothing. My sister, I offer you these rocks as a reminder that our lives matter more than their power. That life in all form demands the same respect we all give to money. That these issues will affect each and every one of us. None of us is immune. And that each and every one of us has to decide if we will rise. So there's a lot to think about and a lot to feel about. And so what can we do? The problem is so big and I'm only one person. You're only one person. And what we might experience, it's really a thing now to experience ecological anxiety, to feel this energy and not know what to do with it, to feel the emotion and not know what to do with it. But what we do know is that people together make a difference, right? There are 500 of us in this room and we have the capacity 
to speak up, to speak out. I put an article in Canvas, 20, 20 ways you can reduce your reliance on fossil fuels. I hope that you'll look at it and see what there you might be able to do. And then continue to talk about it. Be inspired to talk about it with other people. Because where we are right now, we are in crisis. What crisis means, it, the definition of crisis is that there's danger and opportunity. Earlier in the class, I used urgency and opportunity. So if action is not taken, it will take the planet into an unprecedented climate future. If we compare it to what has happened in all of human evolutionary history, climate change is shaping the future of our civilization and the whole planet. So as daunting as it is, we need to know that there are other people working on this, that we can work toward change together. So what happens, my question to you today, is how we can make choices, right? How we can make our choices. So what happens if we think about that love that we defined on Monday and again this morning, and how can we empower ourselves with that love, move us forward with the things that we love? It might be those trees that you love, those sea turtles that you love, that ocean that you love. So thinking about how can we use that and feel empowered? Because what might really change if we move forward? It hasn't worked for years to scare people into change. That hasn't worked. To bribe people to change, that hasn't worked. So what happens if we change because of the love, the, that emotion that we feel? We can move forward with our choices, with our creativity, and all of this takes courage. So I'll leave you with this note. The only thing we have to do to be sure we will leave a ruined world for our children and our grandchildren is to do exactly what we're doing right now. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy this beautiful day.